Can anyone hear me? Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nick Lum. Uh, this is Ned Shower. Uh, we're from Horton Works, which is a software company providing um, enterprise-grade uh, big data uh, open source software. Um, we've got a similar business model to uh, Red Hat, so it's all um, uh, taking open source projects, uh, packaging them up uh, so they're easy to use, uh, which you can download freely and, and uh, try out. Um, and if you, uh, you, most of our revenue comes from uh, support subscriptions, so it's very similar to, to Red Hat. Um, so uh, we, we also provide professional services consulting, and I'm a member of the uh, Asia Pacific uh, PS team. Um, prior to joining Horton Works, I was with eBay, uh, and then prior to that, University of Sydney. Um, Ned, do you want to? Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, <coughs> Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ned. I've been with HodoWorks for the last two years and the solution engineering team. Uh, I'm going to be handing over to Nick, so um, he'll be running with the most of the Prezo. Uh, but I wanted to know, uh, as a quick hands out, who have been working on the Hadoop ecosystem uh, before or have any experience with it so far? Yeah, okay. Awesome. Brilliant. Good. Okay. So we'll get started. Um, Apache Metron, it's a platform uh, for security teams to monitor and analyze their organization's network. And it was um, built based on uh, open uh, source big data components. And a lot of them came from the Hadoop family of technologies. Um, the idea of it is to provide a single pane of glass um, for security workers to get all the information they need to, to do their jobs. And it's currently in an incubator phase with the uh, Apache Foundation. Um, the sponsor is Hortonworks. The commercial sponsor is Hortonworks. Um, but it did, it did actually start as a project in Cisco uh, under the name of uh, OpenSOC or OpenSOC. So I'll just give you a quick rundown of what we'll be talking about. Um, first, we'll talk about the, um, uh, the problem space that uh, Apache Metron is operating in. Uh, including the features and the benefits that, that it uh, gives you. And then we'll have a quick look at um, uh, the, the components that make up Metron. So that's the stream processing side of it, as well as the data fault side of it. And then finally, uh, Ned's going to give you a, a run through of um, Apache NiFi, which is a, a really useful tool to get data from one place to another. And, and for Metron, we use it to, to bring in uh, a lot of the data uh, to, to um, ingest. So if you have a look at um, the Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, which is a, a report on uh, disclosed breaches of organizations' networks. They, they do one every year. They've got some charts in, in, in that. If you, if you have a look at it, things seem to be uh, getting quite a lot worse. Uh, 2016's report showed that 82% uh, of breaches uh, occurred within minutes. So um, that's someone, uh, someone who shouldn't be in the network getting in within minutes, but for the more sophisticated attacks, they persisted undetected for uh, eight months on average. And it's kind of no surprise when you um, think about what uh, ch a challenge that security workers have in detecting and mitigating these kinds of risks, um, as well as facing organizational uh, hurdles to, to get visibility into applications as they're being installed in the environment. They've got just basic technical problems. Uh, the, uh, the information that, that you need to, to really keep an eye on things, it, it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and it um, is often siloed into different uh, systems. So you've got this problem of, of variety, first of all. And on top of that, you will also have uh, problems of volumes. So having, having a, enough data to actually get a good picture on things can actually prove a challenge, especially if you're using a, a system where they charge by the gig to, um, to store your data. And the same can be said for the velocity at which you want to ingest that data and process it. Um, if there's a, a, a high cost associated with that, 
then um, you, you might be sort of skimping on, on that side of things and not getting a very uh, good picture on your network. So um, that's why the pe people, lots of people have been looking at using big data technologies to solve that problem. Um, so they've been around for quite a while and they have solved the problem of dealing with variety, volume and velocity, which is known as the three Bs. Um, and because it's been around for a while, it's quite mature. And if you look at Hadoop, it turned 10 uh, last year. Um, and so there's quite a bit of uh, uh, tooling around to make it easier to manage. It, it didn't always, it wasn't always that easy. And um, as well as that, there's quite a bit of expertise out in the community and you can, um, you can get uh, commercial support from companies like Hortonworks as well. So that means uh, building Metron on, on uh, these technologies is, uh, makes a lot of sense because you can leverage all of that, uh, that maturity. And you get uh, four um, main features out of that. The first is that you can ingest data from all these disparate sources. So you can get uh, high volume stuff like packet capture, uh, net flow, and then you can also um, uh, feed in intrusion detection system data. You can bulk load all of your, your email archives, uh, server logs, and you can also get uh, in enrichment data in there. And enrichment data is uh, stuff that you, you add on to the telemetry that you're, you're bringing in. So it'll be things like um, uh, threat intelligence feeds, uh, who is information, um, geo IP uh, information, and, and, and that gives you a, a better view of what's going on once you, once you merge those pieces of information. Now, doing all of that can be done on the fly because we have um, stream processing. And the stream processing part of Metron, it does, does a few things. It does normalization and standardization of the data that's coming in. So that is, um, uh, for example, uh, it, that there'll be a set of, uh, say, seven, seven fields that all of the information has to have. That'll be source IP, destination IP, uh, source and destination ports, uh, uh, protocol, timestamp. These things will, will all exist on all the uh, items that get uh, uh, streamed in. And then the next phase is to enrich those, those pieces of information. Um, with things like the geo um, uh, resolution uh, or the, the threat intelligence feeds. You, you keep doing the enrichment until you build up uh, a whole lot of features, as many as you, you can, on the item that you're streaming in. And uh, from that, you can have a model or, or some uh, assessment of how, risk, how, much, how, how much of a threat that item is and hopefully also a uh, uh, confidence rating on that, on that assessment. So from there, the, um, the, the items are streamed into the uh, indexing system. And the purpose of that is to provide a, a real-time uh, interface to the, um, to the data so that you can have a dashboard it provides a, a UI like a lot of uh, SIEMs do. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar, SIEM is a security of, uh, information and event management system. It's just a kind of way of looking at what's going on with your, your systems. Usually it's uh, log data that's, that's visualized. So Splunk uh, is kind of an interface that people will be, uh, probably be familiar with. As well as going in there, it also goes into a long-term store, like, uh, which we call the data vault. Um, so being based on, on Hadoop and HDFS, you can uh, scale uh, your storage out horizontally, and it's, it's relatively cheap. So you could, you could keep your uh, historical data for, for years if you wanted. Um, and that can be useful for forensics, or uh, hopefully more importantly, uh, preventative stuff by, by getting a better understanding on, on what's going on. So I'm just going to switch over to a demo if I can now. Uh, 
of the web UI. Oof. Okay, so this is, um, if, you, if you go to the, uh, the, the Metron wiki and you install the, um, uh, the Vagrant-based um, uh, instance, uh, you end up with a, a Kibana-based dashboard like this. And you can see here um, it, it, what it's doing. It's, it's just a VM that's uh, generating some dummy data and, and feeding it into to Metron. And we've got here uh, the events that are coming in. Um, uh, there's two types of events, events showing here, a couple of coming from the Snort uh, topology and some from the Bro topology. Um, and you can see the, the, the um, results of the, the geo enrichment in this case. Uh, you can see the events are coming from, from different mapped points on, on, the, on the globe here. Um, and then furthermore, you, you, can, you get breakdowns of uh, the actual individual events as they come in. Um, if you look, I'll just quickly get to... So yeah, this, some of this stuff is being um, retrieved from PCAP uh, data and, and then Bro is doing deep packet inspection on it to, uh, to, to resolve what type of um, traffic it is. And if I, I drill into one of these, you can see that it has um, a whole bunch of fields in, but you can see that there are enrichments uh, as well as um, uh, source information uh, like where did the, where, where did that information come from? Um, yeah, so you you get a very uh, detailed view of of every event that comes in. Just switch back to the Prezo. So these were my I get rid of that. So ha having everything in one place uh, like this in the interface makes it a lot easier for um, for the worker trying to investigate an event because. They no longer have to uh, do things like copy out of the seam, uh, an IP address out of the seam into Maxmine, which is your geo IP, to try and get a location on, on the source of an attack or something like that. Um, and and if, if you do enrich your data enough, you get this um, context all in one place, um, so you get a much faster way of understanding what's, what's going on. Uh, we don't have time to go through uh, a, a sort of a workflow, but um, if you search for war on stealth cyber attacks, you'll see a YouTube um, uh, presentation uh, done by uh, our colleagues, um, as well as the, the slides on SlideShare. It basically shows how a typical phishing attack can, can take days to investigate uh, and come to a resolution on. Uh, whereas once you have everything in Metron, you can you can uh, resolve that in minutes. So in addition to that uh, user interface, having everything also streamed into your data vault um, gives you the ability to do um, user and entity behavior analysis. And that gives you an understanding of what is normal, what are normal signals, what are abnormal signals. So. Um, because you've got all of that data in there, you, you get a much more confident uh, idea of, of what's happening and what's normal and what's abnormal. And you can just use all the conventional big data tools like Hive, which is a SQL-like interface um, to, for, for uh, large data sets. Um, Pig, which is like a, kind of like a Swiss Army knife uh, manipulator. Um, Spark and, and Jupyter uh, and Zeppelin as, as interfaces to that, so if you're familiar with any of those tools. But in addition to being able to sort of interrogate the data, you can also use it to train uh, machine learning models. And the beauty of that is that um, you can generate more sensitive and accurate um, uh, triggers for alerting, um, which adapt to your environment, so when there are legitimate changes to your to your environment, um, or legitimate changes to user behaviour, um, the the models can be trained. So, having this huge number of features that you're you're uh, building, you're importing, um, is something that the machine learning can do that uh, humans trying to tune uh, triggering rules would have no hope of being able to keep up with. 
Just to uh, give you a very quick overview of the components. Uh, so this is data flowing in from the left and in from the left and uh, going into the, uh, the stores on the, on the right. Um, uh, so there's the, the sources of telemetry are on, on the left-hand side here, and Metron um, basically splits them into two types. Uh, the first type at the bottom here is um, uh, the, the high volume, high velocity stuff, and that will generally be PCAP. Um, you may find that you don't have the capacity to do PCAP and you can just do uh, NetFlow, but that's also um, catered for as a, a custom probe. And it goes um, straight into Kafka, which is our um, uh, uh, the buffer. It's a, it, Kafka is a um, message queuing system for anyone who's not, not familiar with it. Um, the other type of uh, telemetry will be more, uh, probably more unique to every environment. So that will be uh, application logs, um, uh, appliance logs, uh, basically all, all the sort of random siloed bits that, that I was talking about earlier. And that's where um, NiFi excels um, as, a, as a tool to bring all these disparate uh, pieces in, into uh, Metron. And it also goes into Kafka here, the, um, uh, the, the message queue. The real work uh, on the stream happens in a platform called Storm, which is a stream processor, high, a very high performance stream processor, uh, which is horizontally scalable. So as you get more stuff, you just add more nodes. Um, and uh, it, it's doing those three things that I mentioned earlier. It's doing the normalization or standardization of the fields that come in. It, it's doing the enrichment. So it's taking all those extra bits of information that you can join with the uh, um, with the stream and adding those so you get a, a nice big set of features that you can analyze. And it's doing the identification and tagging. Um, so deciding whether or not the item is a threat or not and the confidence level. So during the enrichment phase, um, HBase, which is a, a, a big data uh, key value store, is used to um, store the um, uh, the enrichment data, and it's then queried by Storm on the fly to, to add to the items. Um, so HBase sits on top of the uh, Hadoop storage layer, HDFS. Uh, again, horizontally scalable to, to massive uh, amounts. Um, and uh, also the, the, the processing of the data at rest um, is, is done with within the YARN layer. YARN stands for yet another resource negotiator. It's uh, Hadoop's um, native containerization uh, technology. And in there, you can run a variety of um, compute uh, tasks. So uh, Spark, for example, sits very nicely in there. Um, and you can run Hive queries, those SQL-like queries, uh, which, which trigger off map reduce jobs that, that run in YARN. And of course, then you've also got that Kibana and Elasticsearch uh, web UI stuff, which uh, the, the output is also going into. But that's generally that the, you're not going to be storing tons of data in there. You, you, you'll be more limited uh, by how much you can store in there. OK, and I think now we're on to uh, Ned's NiFi uh, part of the Thank talk. You, Thank you, Nick. Um, so anybody here worked with Apache NiFi before? Awesome. So I, I promise you, a, a lot of the people here, even if you haven't done anything with NiFi, once once you see some of the presentation, you'll definitely want to try it next uh, ne ne next time. Especially if you're dealing with grabbing data and the data pipes and data transporting from a place to another. But the interesting part here that NiFi wasn't built by a tech company; it was actually built at the NSA, uh, and they were m facing the major challenges of, of data transport from a place to another. Uh, but what we end up doing is we end up acquiring the company who was actually uh, developing the, 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 the products for uh, the NSA. Uh, the NSA officially uh, open sourced uh, 40 to 50 percent of NIFI, uh, and of course the other 50 percent nobody knows about. Uh, but according to the NSA, this is what people, regular people would care about anyway. So. 
uh, NIFI started from an NSA, and every, everybody says, you know what, data flow could be easy sometimes, like it's all about creating these jobs that moves data from a place to another. Whether we're using a Splunk forwarder, we were using uh, something like uh, Logstash, uh, whether I'm running database uh, jobs just to move data from a database to another. Uh, but eventually, over time, that doesn't look so easy as this, um, and it gets really complicated. And you're gonna call all of these different teams who are responsible for the data transport, and try to revise all the scripts and see what are, what are the problems here, did that success, did it not? We need a job manager, we need a lot of more stuff to make it work, especially in an enterprise where you have all of that uh, sources of data. Uh, NIFI makes it easier because it's completely visual as a star. Uh, in the back, we do have XML files being generated, so we work with what we call a workflow. So every box that you can see here, for example, is it's, it's got its own workflow. So you can, for example, uh, I can dig deeper in a box and see what is that workflow includes. And in this, um, uh, in, in this example, we're collecting data from different logs. And every box here referred to as a processor. And a processor, and this is, this is where the beauty is, you don't have to write your own scripts to do stuff any, any longer because NIFI out of the box provide you with over 180 processors that the community contributed to. And whoever comes up with a new processor just pushed back to our open source uh, GitHub library and people can reuse it and download it. Uh, so if one of, one of the biggest challenges as well in data movement is knowing where the data is coming from. Uh, some people can push the wrong data, some people can impersonate the source and send the wrong data to the wrong place. But NIFI do keep track and trace every piece of data that comes in from the source into the target directly. So at any moment of time, you can go back from the data that resides somewhere and ask the question, where did you come from? And it'll actually take you through a whole map of where that data came from. Uh, we're working with one of the biggest telcos here in Australia, and NIFI been uh, uh, proven there in, in multiple use cases. And the challenge was nobody wanted, for example, what if uh, somebody came in in the morning and changed the workflow and I didn't know about it and start forwarding the data to his personal email address, for example, or something, and by the end of the day, he deleted that processor. These are the things that people can do with scripts easily and you can't be traced that easily. One well, NIFI can immediately track what happened and you can have a complete history of where the data came from and how did it go. Uh, I'm gonna go through a quick demo if we do have time, but the use cases for NIFI are a lot. Uh, a lot of people use it, for example, for Splunk offloads. If you're working with Splunks, we try to ingest data using NIFI, send to Splunk what Splunk needs, and reroute the others to, uh, if you have a hybrid deployment like Elastic and Splunk, you could hybrid to Elastic. If you wanna, if you wanna keep the data for some time, you'll just put it in, in Hadoop, in HDFS, uh, we can connect to databases, the processor are, uh, are good. Uh, just to confirm, do we, we do have, I guess, uh, five minutes to go through the demo. Uh, can we have a switch to the other uh, screen, please? Thank you. So the first thing, when, what happens when you download NiFi, and uh, NiFi works on most of the platforms, uh, you can run it as a single node uh, on a server, VM, laptop, but eventually you want to run it in cluster mode if you want to scale eventually. Uh, NIFI has been rated as it can do 35 megabytes per second data transfer for, every, for an average of six cores, uh, six virtual cores, six um, uh, V cores. So, so you can tell how massively powerful NIFI is in moving data. So you have to always be careful about what's gonna happen after NIFI because we tend to choke a lot of systems who can't handle that much throughput. Uh, so this is when you have to redistribute to, to multiple places if there's a lot of processing happening after NIFI. NIFI is as easy as drag a processor and you get a list of all kind of processors that you can think about. So either we want to uh, listen to syslogs, for example, uh, I, I can choose that processor, I can add it here, and that becomes my beginning of my data story. So this is where the data is coming from. I can easily configure it saying, um, 
what protocol I want to listen to, uh, which, uh, which board, SSL or not, uh, all kind of uh, information. The best part that the scheduling is built in every processor. And especially, we've, we've been all used to the good old cron, but we have a timer-driven schedule strategy, and we have a cron-driven uh, strategy. So that would depend on how much I want to run for, for how long, um, or I can just use the, the normal run schedule as a cron job. Um, eventually, you can, you can say what happens if I get an error, do I want to debug, what level of messages or warnings or errors do I want to get out of every processor. Uh, another processor could be something like uh, I want to listen to an HTTP, for example, or, or Elasticsearch, or everything you can think of is actually uh, mostly in NiFi connection to databases. So that would be the ingestion part, and then you can think of what I want to do with that data. I want to do an action. I want to um, I want to do some parsing, whether it's a syslog parsing. I want to do uh, scan for contents. So I want to go through the text textual content that I'm actually getting of these and do some sort of uh, intelligence. So based on success, for example, I want to do an action. And based on that action, I want to send the data to the right place. So the scan content could be I want anything that would contain a word like warnings uh, or an error. Um, I want you to immediately uh, notify somebody, for example, by email. and eventually put that data uh, either in a database or um, up in a, in a, in a log uh, uh, search or anything like that. So I can say put Hive, for example, that put it in Hive uh, database in Hadoop directly. You can still put it in Splunk, in uh, Elastic, or whatever you want. I don't think we have a big screen to go through the whole use case. Uh, you can eventually export the whole thing as a template, redeploy it back again. We now have burgeoning. Uh, we can do a lot of stuff uh, with NiFi. There's a lot of stuff you can do in NiFi. There's a lot of blogs out there. Uh, go uh, and uh, check it out and let us know uh, how we can help as well. Uh, any question on the Metron side or the NiFi side? Yep. Yes. Um, um, two, do we run that up? Let us see if this is working. I think yeah, this guy can. Thank you. Um, you haven't talked much about handling indicators of compromise. So hashes, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> So for, for it's this kind of system, I would have thought that's really essential because you want to know what's hosed, right? And, um, and yeah, so, so basically Metron's, Metron's making use of, um, uh, you, you might have threat intelligence feeds to, you, you'll know, like the simple case would be uh, the source IP address is actually known to be generating a lot of um, problems for other organizations and that's already been fed into a um, threat intelligence. Uh, feed and, and you'll know about it from there. That's that's one case. Sure, but sure. the real power would be um, the uh, machine learned models, where you'd actually look at the whole um, gamut of, of features you have in the, uh, the the streamed items, and you'd be able to tell from that uh, that model would would be able to score whether or not something is abnormal or not, and be flagged, and somebody could take a deeper look at it. Right. Uh, again, if you don't have the IOCs, then you don't, you won't see hashes. You won't see. So, so m maybe I should ask you, with reference to a standard, um, are you supporting sticks and taxi? Uh, yes. So, to to be able to support sticks taxi, you have to be managing IOCs that are much more than just IP addresses, and and dots on a map are not that useful, frankly. Really, if you're doing incident response, who cares <coughs> where it claims it came from? What you need to do is attend to the compromised box, right? Yeah, I, I, I guess the answer to that is, um, again, if you've got the, um, uh, the, the full gamut of, uh, of enrichment um, and you've, you've got a model that, has, that understands, based on all of those small details, what is normal and what isn't. Okay. Um, and and then that includes sticks and taxi, that's my question. Yeah. 
Anybody else got questions? Um, I'll just draw your attention to a few of the, uh, the links there. Um, if you're, you're interested in some of the ideas behind um, uh, using big data, I, I, I draw you, I'll send you to uh, Michael Scheibel's uh, blog posts. Um, uh, and, and also, if you, you want to have a look at, um, if you've got questions while you're, you're working with Metron, you can take a look at uh, the, uh, the community, HortonWorks Community Connection site, community.hortonworks.com. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.